Hey everybody, this is David Jeunesse from IBM, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the debut of The Practitioners. <clears throat> and the creator of The Practitioners, George Warner, is here today, and I'll let him tell you a little bit more about the vision of it. But you get it here in this subtitle. We uh, will invite some deep subject matter experts like the one we have today. We will identify a topic that seems to be on everybody's mind, and it's really topics that are coming from our customers, from you. And so we're very happy to, uh, to answer the kind of questions that you want uh, to get answered. Uh, today's special guest, today's topic is hybrid architectures for IBM FileNet Content Manager. And our very special guest today is Mike Winter. And I've worked with Mike probably six, seven years now. <clears throat> Sometimes he's uh, a speaker on stage. Sometimes uh, he's, he's a subject matter expert in, in discussions like this. He's always fascinating. I am uh, always learning from him. And so I'm very happy that, that we have Mike here today. So get your questions together based on the kinds of things that you're doing <clears throat> and the kinds of challenges you're facing. And uh, Mike is often called in. Uh, I remember a story about a, a large uh, state unemployment uh, customer that was struggling to move from the mainframe and <clears throat> what they needed to do was talk to Mike and he helped them. And uh, I'm sure that happens day in and day out. And I want to introduce to you uh, the fellow who came up with the idea here for this session and have him kick it off for us. That is none other than Mr. George Warner. George. Thank you, Dave. But that's not true. It was the uh, public sector user group board that got together and said, Good. we need to figure out what people are doing. So why are we doing this? Um, we're in an odd situation now where technology has exploded. As even during COVID, things kept moving and growing and changing. But it's all, forgive my description, it's all sales happy talk. It's telling us this is the best new sliced bread that you need to buy, but nobody's talking about how to do it, how to get it done, how to maintain it, what are the risks. So we kind of called ourselves the practitioners. We're still figuring out what our logo should be, but uh, they've started us with the, the white coats. People with white coats have chased me many times, but never mind. Um, so we want to bring some discipline and focus into the conversation. How does this get done? What do you need to do? What's the expense? What's the risk? The other part to, to make clear to everybody in the public sector, once we end up with a magical product, we have it for decades. Um, and it literally will define careers, it will define opportunities, and it will define how we deliver services. I was, I had a chance to go see one of my sons graduate from a program in France. Um, and I went to Nîmes, France. This is famous because they have the world's most intact Colosseum. It's built 2000 years ago. And the day before they got there, they hosted a, a concert with Deep Purple. Why is that? How does that fit here? It's because it reflects what it's like in the public sector. We get something and we have to use it for a long time. So we want to make sure it's right when we start. And Mike and Chuck can certainly uh, attest to that. So we just want to get into the nitty gritty. And what is coming at us is how do we do hybrid architecture? What the public sector user group board has, has come through is None of our program people want to put their content in the cloud. IT doesn't want to get held hostage for new costs in the cloud. We don't want to have to pay to access our own information that we're storing, so we don't like that. On top of that, there's a need to leverage some of these capabilities that are only in the cloud. So you can only do that if you're in a hybrid model. And 
there's just lots of questions on how to do it. And Mr. Custard, I'm going to put you on the spot because your questions have driven a lot of this. So you and Chuck and Paul and anybody else, put your questions on the table on what do you want to know about a hybrid architecture for content? Start with you, Mike. Thank you, George. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I, at the state of Minnesota, which is where I'm from, um, we are dabbling with cloud a little bit um, in the sense that we have a proof of concept we're working with IBM on for robotic process automation. It became a pretty easy way to sort of test out the technology because it's a, it's a, it's a background check application. It's hitting only public websites, so it's all public information. There's no real, it's transient information, so there's no long-term storage. So I don't have to really tackle that issue that George alluded to, which is, you know, there's a big apprehension to put our data, most a lot of which, because it's human services mostly, is high data uh, using our terminology. So I'm I'm curious from that perspective, you know, the thought process that went into it, what what risks are there, expenses, that sort of thing. How's that, George? As long as you get all your questions on the table, Chuck, you've been leading this conversation too. Showed up today then. Um, I, I guess one of the questions from us, uh, so I'm Chuck Hobble, I'm from Hennepin County, which happens to also be in Minnesota. So Michael and I, talk once in a while, um, not as often as we should, we will both tell you, but exactly. Um, right. We, we have these environments, long time file net user, um, like, uh, George said at the beginning that, you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread is in front of us apparently. And, uh, we have just questions about how do you make that move? Do you have to do it all in one big bang? Can you move, for example, Content Navigator there and leave everything else where it is? Um, just we're looking for different ways of how do you crack that nut and dip your toes into the, the, the latest technology. And I think Michael said it too, how do you get to look at the new things that aren't the old traditional core file net uh, content services things, right, alongside your existing environment. So things like ADP and RPA and those things. So that's where my questions would be. Okay, Paul? Well, Mr. Cordelessi. Uh, he's never shy. He put in a, a, a question in the chat. No, he's not shy. So I'm surprised. Uh -oh. <laughs> I didn't expect to be called out, but <clears throat> yes, we're in the infancy of this. And I think where, where we're moving forward is with a uh, standalone system. So, you know, my, our concerns are a little different than Chuck's, you know, we're not going to, uh, you know, try to move piece by piece. We're going to build an entirely new open shift. Uh, you know, on-prem initially, um, uh, and and see how it works within our world, and then down the road we would be migrating our content and our applications onto that platform. Okay. So what it's taken candies? us? My goodness, it's well, taken us nearly two months just to get the hardware and the open shift. You know, stood up. It was <clears throat> only last night that we we got the bastion up and running. Anyone else have questions they want to put on the table before we turn it over to Mr. Winters? Don't be shy. Right. So, George? Yep. Uh, uh, you know, part of my question would be, how do we migrate our, you know, 30 years of existing content onto you know, this hybrid or, you know, on-prem or, or worse, off-prem uh, implementation of this? And who has had experience doing it so far, uh, and what kind of insights can they offer us? Hence the title of the practitioners. How do we make this work? So if there are no other questions, we'll turn it over to Mike. Uh, on top of that, if anybody has a question, do not be shy. This is why we brought these people to the table. 
and it's okay to throw elbows. Yes, it is. Uh, well, good morning and good afternoon, and I'm not sure where everybody is, but uh, um, thanks for joining us today. My name is uh, Mike Winter. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the chief architect for our content services platform. I'm out of our development group. I report into Annette Brooks, who's our VP of development for all of that stuff. Um, and I've been, you know, involved with enterprise content management for a long, long time. I uh, helped build the platform back in the FileNet days and came into IBM through that acquisition and um, I've been doing this for a long time. So hopefully, you know, some of my experience and some of what I've been seeing with our both private and public sector clients in this space will be useful to you guys. Um, um, you know, feel free to ask questions as we go. I much prefer having an interactive discussion. I did put together some slides just to help kind of guide the conversation, but I'm more than happy to take this wherever you guys would like. So let me, you know, share some things just so we have uh, something to look at while we're talking through this, and I will um, try and pause periodically to, you know, give us some points to have discussion and stuff. Perfect. So this was, you know, one definition that I found out there as I was, you know, putting together a few thoughts for today's discussion, um, kind of about hybrid cloud. It basically says hybrid cloud integrates public cloud services private cloud services and on-prem infrastructure and provides an orchestration management application portability across all three. The result is a single, unified, and flexible distributed computing environment where an organization can run and scale its traditional cloud-native workloads on the most appropriate computing model. Now, this is sort of the, you know... Um, so, you know, like, wait, Mike, what, what does that mean in English? Well, it means, you know, this is the sort of sliced bread model, which is, boy, everything's going to be great. You can run anything wherever you want and, you know, shift workloads wherever you need to and to take the cheapest model, et cetera, et cetera. The reality is a lot more complicated than that. But logically, I think what this means is in what, how you should sort of view cloud, particularly as you're in this migration phase, as essentially an extension to your enterprise network. Much like you have, many of you have multiple data centers today, you really should just view, you know, cloud as another potential data center. And there's, again, a lot of details in that statement, but logically, I think that's how we should view it. And I'm gonna talk in a little bit about, you know, what some of the pros and cons are on both sides of that fence and, um, you know, what some of the drivers are and, you know, how you can move things both either a listen shift model or incrementally and, w again, what some of the sort of um, um, factors are that might affect how you do that move and, and how you migrate that stuff. And so this is a pretty, you know, typical high-level view of this thing. I, I've never been particularly fond of this notion of private, of the term private and public clouds, because it sort of gives this impression that, you know, my on-prem private stuff is secure and, you know, um, um, private and nobody else can access it, and public clouds are somehow the opposite of that, that they're open to everybody and I'm gonna have security problems there, et cetera, et cetera. The reality of it is I've seen plenty of private data centers that have had significant security problems, and we've all seen you know, various breaches over the years, both public and private clouds. Um, you can have very unsecure private clouds, and you can have very secure public clouds. And so you know, I think we need to be careful about you know, this notion that one is secure, one isn't secure, you know, one is private and one is public. It's entirely up to you and how well you manage each of those, and you can make perfectly secure and non-public, you know, um, deployments in a public cloud scenario. So that's just kind of, you know, a comment about the terminology there, but I don't have a better solution. Frankly, we're not changing it at this point anyway. So um, really, again, it comes back to this point of you can use public cloud infrastructure not create a single public internet gateway to that cloud, have a, a, a private gateway only, use a private network link between that, um, 
you know, cloud service and your enterprise network and effectively have a relatively secure, relatively private, you know, um, extension to your enterprise network just like you would if you were building another data center yourself, right? So I think that's really how you should kind of view these things. Conversely, there's a lot of capabilities in these cloud services to enable public-facing cloud infrastructure or, or public-facing infrastructure, meaning, you know, they have pretty good edge networks and, um, you know, the ability to distribute content across, you know, data centers around the globe and depending on what you're trying to accomplish, you know, cloud-hosted services can also be a good opportunity for providing, you know, um, first-rate um, um, internet accessible content into your enterprise. And so, you can absolutely create internet-facing gateways through that, and that may even end up being your predominantly public-facing access point, and your on-prem networks can be, you know, sort of private extensions to that thing. So, the point here is, um, I would keep an open mind about how you want to do this, and, and it is going to vary. And, and I say that because this is what I've seen in practice is customers are taking different approaches to cloud, and they're getting there in different ways, and largely it's driven by their own relative priorities, right? They have, you know, different things they're trying to accomplish. In some cases, they're trying to accomplish better capabilities for building out their public-facing um, internet-facing networks, and that's where they are kind of focused initially. In other cases, it's more of a extension to their back-end private networks, and all their public stuff still comes through, you know, their their other managed networks on their private infrastructure. So, um, and some people are driven by costs, some people are driven by capabilities, you know, they have different priorities as to why they're moving to cloud, and that's obviously going to affect you know, how they do that move in some cases. And they also have different appetites and different, you know, um, 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 you know, um, ability to accept risk or not, or, you know, or, or more comfortable with putting certain things in the cloud and less comfortable with other things. That also affects people's decisions about what they move to cloud and how they move it and, and all of that. So, uh, yeah, let me pause here. All right. Um... I guess at some level, I'm looking for what are the top three business reasons to do this? Not the technical permutation, but why do you want to go on this journey? Yeah. One thing that jumps out to me is a lesson from COVID was um, employment systems were never sized to handle a pandemic load. And yep. we, this was the third pandemic of the century. We didn't catch this one, but it doesn't mean it's the last. Yep. So, in the cloud, my my instinct says you can scale quicker. Uh, but again, it's business first. What are the top three business reasons why we want to do this, and how do we encompass it into a, a hybrid model? Right. Well, I can sort of share what I've heard from some of our clients that are moving to cloud. And I would say the one you just mentioned, which is, you know, functional capabilities, and I'll break that into two two things. So, functional in the sense of scale and elasticity and capability. So, more or less this notion of having kind of unlimited compute capacity and storage capacity to scale pretty elastically um, as your workloads change. And some of those changes can be over periods of time, and some can be relatively quickly, like we, like you, you know, the example you just gave, which was COVID and sort of semi-immediate um, requirements that landed on various organizations where they had to suddenly have much larger workloads that were available and being able to sort of handle that. So functional capabilities in terms of scaling, and then functional capabilities in terms of um, um, just different. Uh, areas that you might want to take advantage of, whether that's, you know, text extraction or data mining or, um, you know, image and object recognition or, you know, better capabilities that you don't have on-prem for, 
um, um, event processing or um, monitoring or, you know, the, the whole gamut of everything we've traditionally used on-prem but have had to install and manage individually. Most of these modern cloud services have a lot of those services as hosted capabilities that you can more or less take advantage of on demand, uh, meaning there's not long lead times to get those provisioned. You know, you don't have to provision the hardware underneath them. You don't have to provision the software. You know, it's all largely managed services that you can take advantage of, and just you just need to basically plug into those. And so they're viewing cloud services as a way to get access to capabilities that they've maybe wanted to deploy and use for a long period of time but have just never been able to afford and manage. Those are now available in these cloud hosted environments and they can take advantage of it. And then the third one, and this one comes up, you know, a lot, is cost. Um, you know, we're getting a more commodity-based pricing in some of these cloud-hosted services. That one can be a bit of a, you know, there's two sides of that coin, right? It, it, it a first order, you know, they are relatively inexpensive. Um, what you can find is as you move to cloud, because it's easy for lots of different groups to sort of just start accessing those things, and if they're not very efficient about it and you aren't managing your cost structure, you know, your costs can actually kind of run away from you because there's not much gating people turning these services on and starting to use them, and your costs can actually go up in the aggregate. And whether or not you're getting, you know, sufficient value for that cost is, is you know, something you have to manage. So it really comes down to managing, you know, your teams and how much of those services you're using and being cognizant of the cost that they're going to incur and making sure that you're choosing services and things that, you know, um, from a cost perspective are, you know, are, are a positive thing for your organization. But for a lot of our private sector, you know, groups, you know, they're viewing cloud as a way to lower their costs. And that one can be a complicated discussion because, you know, particularly with our on-prem managed services, there's a lot of elements to cost. There's obviously, you know, the hardware that those things get run on, there's the software and licenses and support, you know, cost of, of the pieces that you purchase to run those services. And, again, and of course, there's the people that are, you know, running those services on a day-to-day -day basis, all of that makes up the sort of aggregate cost of that service. And those oftentimes get sort of distributed across many different elements because we have these, you know, large IT organizations and, you know, the, it's hard to sort of determine, well, exactly how much am I paying, you know, per gigabyte of storage that I'm managing and maintaining on-prem and how does that compare with, you know, a much more, sort of objective pricing model with a cloud-hosted service, which is really is charging you, you know, per gigabyte, you know, per month that you're storing up there. You know, I don't know what else to say other than that can be a challenging thing to manage, but what I am seeing from our private sector clients especially is they're certainly seeing, when they've done the analysis, they're seeing some benefits from a cost perspective, and that's driving part of their move to cloud services. Is there something you can share that shows this? I, I I get what people are saying, but nobody's proved it. Um, nobody's come back with an probably example. Probably the so biggest it used to cost example me a, is now it cost me B. Yeah, the biggest example I think is probably just the fact that we're seeing a relative signif relatively significant portion of our private sector clients who are largely driven, you know, by profit-oriented structures within their organization um, moving to cloud-hosted services. So, you know, That's, it's hard to have we're, a document we're happy for the banks, that does a you significant have... breakdown of those cost structures and how they arrived at that, but what we are seeing is a significant number of those clients making those moves. Do you have any public sector who has data that they can share? Andrew, the public se se sector we can share. We don't have any competitive advantage. We're just trying to deliver services. Right, right, right. Um, short answer, I don't know off the top of my head. I can ask around and see if we have any public sector clients that have made that data available. I don't know. I don't know. So I, mine is more anecdotal. Like I say, I'm seeing you know our private sector clients moving in a relatively significant way. 
they tend to be, you know, largely motivated by cost. I mean, that's that's one of their primary motivations because, you know, they're driven on a really a quarter by quarter basis for, you know, their profit margins and they wouldn't be doing that if it was if they had gotten there and found that that wasn't the case and what we would have been seeing by now, especially because it's been a while that this is, transition has been happening, we would have seen clients that have been moving there and then we're moving back. And I'm not really seeing many clients that are moving back. And I'm seeing more clients that are moving to cloud services. That's just the simple reality of it. But many of us have, have worked hard at clawing money out of budget and it's not a fun thing. So we need numbers to prove. Hey, George, I'm going to go through our client reference uh, uh, a library, and I'll see if I can find some good examples of that. Uh, they would have to be fairly recent because this has really been happening in the last two, three years. So I'll see if I can find some <clears throat> something not anecdotal, but something a little bit more quantifiable. Yeah, yeah. We got, we got questions posted. Maybe we should look at those, too. Let's see here. And anybody else has got questions? I mean, chime in on the discussion. And Dave, I don't know if you want to read these off to me. I'm in full screen, so I'm not seeing all the chat stuff at the moment. I probably should have. There's probably a way to do. That. I got a no, question. No worries. We're, in fact, it's better to read it out loud so that everybody can kind of hear it. So. Um, I got uh, a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I'm an um, automation uh, brand sales specialist here in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my question is uh, for you. Um, um mike would be what is the reason for the customer to go to the cloud and um considering they already they already made a big investment on all those data centers they have what is the reason for them to quit uh, using uh, those data centers and start moving or migrating everything to the cloud i mean i'm wondering about that well, so again, what we're seeing in the private sector is, you know, it's not like they're, people are just moving everything from their data center into cloud and shutting down their data centers. Um, it's much more incremental than that, right? So, you know, it's not like they're not able to take advantage of those data centers, but data centers, as I'm sure you guys are well aware, you know, have a relatively significant maintenance cost to them over time, which means, you know, if you're going to maintain those data centers over an extended period of time, you have to invest in them. You have to constantly sort of upgrade your hardware and your networks and all the other stuff that goes along with that. And so what we're seeing with clients is, you know, rather than expanding those networks, they're basically expanding into cloud-hosted services. They're treating those cloud services really as an extension to that network, kind of is, you know, so rather than adding a third data center, they basically add a cloud-hosted, you know, portion of their stuff and treat it kind of as their third data center. And they're going to keep maintaining their two data centers, but they're not going to build the third one. So that's, you know, one sort of scenario is when it comes to expansion, sort of expanding, if you will, into the cloud. And sometimes that's a bit of a juggling thing where they're moving some things to cloud and freeing up capacity in their on-prem data centers and expanding some on-prem stuff there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's one scenario. The other is, look, I've got, you know, three data centers, but one of them is, you know, kind of aging out and we're either going to have to invest a bunch of money to sort of bring it up to par with our other two newer data centers, or I'm going to move those workloads into cloud and basically I'm going to decommission that third data center because it's just sort of, you know, I don't, it's not worth the investment there for me to go do that. So those are the most common scenarios that I see with our private sector clients in terms of how they're managing that cost. And, you know, they're not just walking away from that money they have in their on-prem data centers. They're leveraging that and, and will do so until it makes sense. And most of these clients aren't ever going to be probably 100% in cloud. And, you know, it's probably going to be a hybrid scenario for them for a long, long time. So oh, I, I, I got to chime in here because everybody's time is precious and we're at um, 35 minutes after we started. I think we're off topic a little bit. I don't think we're addressing the conversation of how to do a hybrid environment so with content. content at home. Yeah. So. I don't know what to do about content. Maybe we come back for another discussion. Mr. Hill's got some pretty good points that need to be uh, expanded upon. But 
I think the question was, how do we keep content on prem yep. and leverage capability that's sitting in the cloud and create a hybrid? Okay, so I've got a slide that covers that. Let me jump to that. Before I do, let me just make two very broad based comments I should have made up front here. One is, I'm kind of focused on um, cloud as an extension to our enterprise network where we still manage and operate all the functionality. It's just whether we're doing it on-prem data center or in a cloud data center. There's obviously a whole SaaS component to this as well where various services are available in a SaaS model and should I, you know, in, you know, leverage those services and incorporate those things. I think we ought to have a separate discussion if we want to just on that topic because it's a much broader discussion about, you know, pros and cons of SaaS versus on-prem managed stuff. And what I'm going to focus on today is, you know, your existing managed stuff and how you take that and move it to cloud infrastructure. The second point is, obviously, IBM's made a big investment in Kubernetes. You know, we view containerization as a core element of making it easier to um, distribute your, um, um, you know, compute environments across multiple different environments and providing effectively a common operating system or platform, if you will, that can sit across all of these things and sort of span your public and private networks and help you manage some of that migration. I'm also not going to go into a lot of detail. I'm not really, um, you know, an open shift expert and we can bring other people on to kind of go into those details about how that will help you with this migration. I'm going to focus more on the functional aspects of our content service and what that looks like. Obviously, we've containerized all of that, so we run perfectly well in a Kubernetes environment and there can be real advantages there, but I just wanted to make those two points before we sort of switch gears here. Okay, hopefully you guys can see this. So I put together, you know, a very high-level slide to sort of talk about what I've been seeing with clients that are moving into, um, into cloud with our content services, what that looks like, and sort of what your options are and how they do that. So. Each of these boxes sort of represents a content services deployment. This is a vastly, vastly oversimplified view of it, obviously, but at some level we have um, a set of compute capabilities denoted by the two compute nodes, and then sitting under that, we effectively have three persistent stores that make up our content system. We've got a relational database, which holds all of our metadata um, and the, you know, definition of the document itself, per se. We've got um, a storage area where all of the content, the binary content, gets written out to and stored. And then, of course, um, if you have full text indexing enabled, we have a text search uh, um, um, persistent store where all of those indexes live where that content has been full text indexed. And at some dimension or another, you know, you're going to move these things potentially from one side of this um, um, diagram to the other, where the left side sort of represents our on-prem private cloud um, deployments and the right side represents our hosted cloud services or our public cloud. Um, the first one at the very top there, this is the lift and shift model, right? We're going to, in one fell swoop, we're going to pick up what we have on-prem and, you know, migrate it over en masse to our public cloud, and after the switch over, everything is going to run on, on the public cloud environment. And again, you know, how you're coming into that environment, like whether you have an internet gateway on the public cloud side or whether that's still coming in through your, you know, internet gateway into your um, on-prem databases and then getting routed through a private network to the cloud, that's somewhat orthogonal to this discussion. But um, suffice it to say, lift and shift everything at once. Um, the other option is storage first, and this is probably one of the more common scenarios we see just because a, it's easy. Um, B, storage tends to be a fairly big, you know, cost element for clients and one area where, you know, that really has been pretty commoditized in cloud-hosted services. Um, B, it tends to be, you know, a relatively difficult thing to maintain from a HADR standpoint, requires a fair bit of management and infrastructure to keep that content replicated across multiple sites and all that kind of stuff, and that's another driver for doing that. And so this is what I call the storage first move, where effectively I'm keeping my compute um, nodes, you know, the CPE servers and all of that stuff. I'm keeping my database and my tech search stuff on-prem, and I'm basically just adding another storage area. And I'm either 
doing a move content and migrating new content, or in some cases, I basically just set it up for you know new content going forward, where I've got storage in the public cloud and storage in, uh, and some of the legacy stuff is still sitting on-prem. And that works perfectly fine, right? We have support for IBM Cause, which is our cloud object storage. We have support for S3. We have support for Azure, you know, um, object storage, et cetera. And you can basically just set up a new storage area and start pushing your content into the cloud. In your case, we've seen this mentioned a couple of times. Sometimes that's a sensitive thing, and that's the last thing. If and maybe they don't ever move the storage, right? They or the the content. They want the content, you know, under physical control. Um, they don't want it sitting up in the cloud, and that's where you know maybe the other direction makes more sense. Meaning, I'm going to move my compute nodes and some of that. Um, infrastructure up into public cloud, but I'm going to leave my storage devices and all of my, you know, physical access to that content is going to remain um, in my private cloud, and I'll just access it from there. And there's some things, you know, you have to be cognizant of there and um, be careful of there, but that's another model. So I'm going to pause here. There's a lot more elements to this that we can talk about, but let me pause because there are probably some questions right off the top. Hi, Mike. This is Prashant from uh, FIA. It's, ha it's in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So we are also uh, discussing with IBM on this, like, you know, uh, moving to containers and everything. So uh, there's one thing that's not addressed here. How do we uh, migrate our custom applications? Because there are some limitations to the containers, like how you connect to them. That's not discussed because, I mean, I, this is a uh, high level, but I mean, if you have a lot of custom applications that connects to FileNet and you know, do processing, uh, it doesn't support EJB. So, I mean, we need to change that also along with this, like, you know, uh, so is, I mean, IBM addressing that or? Like... Yeah, so there's a few, um, there's a, yeah. So in general, you know, your client applications, you know, can work effectively against these same compute nodes, regardless of which side they're working on. Um, you mentioned the EJB thing. That is a limitation of our container-based stuff. You know, um, largely you should be able to run over both the EJB protocol and the WSI protocol, and it should work, you know, equally well. Um, and we can certainly, you know, have some discussions about that for you if you're having trouble doing that. Uh, one thing to note here is, uh, I'm. Even though I mentioned just a minute ago, you know, that we have containerized all of our stuff and that, you know, Kubernetes is a good, efficient, you know, um, and provides a lot of capabilities for helping to manage multi-cloud or hybrid cloud environments, nothing about this diagram um, suggests that you have to do it that way. In other words, you can run non-containerized deployments in this same mode just as well as containerized deployments in this mode. So you shouldn't feel like you absolutely have to go and move everything to containerized deployments to, to get here. Having said that, look, I'm a big proponent of containerization. I think there's a lot of benefits to it. I think, you know, to the extent that you can get to containers, you will get a lot of advantages from that, and it will help you in this um, hybrid world especially, um, and we should try and enable that for you. Um, if the EJB thing really is a gating factor for you, let's have a discussion about that. My guess is it really shouldn't be um, overall, but um, um, we, we can help you with that. Sure. But largely speaking, both ICN and our API are operating more or less unchanged in these different environments. And so accessing our API across these private networks or accessing ICN across these is fine. I sort of drew these pictures where the compute nodes all move one way or the other, but you can also have them distributed if you want to. You could have ICN running on one side of this picture and the CPEs running on the other side. You obviously have to be pretty careful about you know, the network connection you have between those two points and the latency that's involved there, but there are certainly, you know, capabilities to make that work okay if you need to and want to. Yeah. So Does that answer your question? The, the major, the, yeah, it, it, it did, but the major issue is like, you know, oh, the business users, they should be 
okay with you know migrating this kind because it's like a big project by itself moving to containers like you know migrating everything at a time like i mean if we want to go towards containerization but it's like you know getting approval from them like to migrate all these applications which they use to i mean it's a different network underlying it right. can be done technically but it's like a big project I and mean, getting approved well for that is like a major hurdle for us right now. right yes so, yeah yep yeah so you know obviously in this you know in this middle diagram the storage first one you know nothing has to change with your on prem deployment to take advantage of this now it assumes you're comfortable putting you know your content in cloud storage but you know that's a quick easy way to sort of take advantage of some cloud hosted services and you know um, to the extent that you know storage is a cost factor for you you know that tends to be the biggest driver there is just you know lowering their overall cost of storage is is what i see with that one and again, the fact that it's so quick and easy that it's sort of a, you know, dip your toe in the thing. And again, you don't have to put all of your content there, right? We we have a pretty rich set of capabilities in um, IBM, you know, content services to allow you to set up multiple storage areas and, um, you know, put different classes of documents in different storage tiers and manage those things separately. And so all of that applies in this environment here in terms of how you manage storage on one side or the other of this thing. Is there a public sector entity that has done this that can share their experience with us? Uh, good question. Um, I again, I can ask to find out. I don't know. I'm trying to think through the ones that I. Uh, there's only a couple that I've been working with closely in the last, you know, 12 or 18 months. Um, Even if there's a public or a private sector entity who's willing to share with us. Oh yeah, we definitely, we definitely, you know, have private sector clients that could give you some experience on this. Um, I, I don't have the list of which of those guys is referenceable and stuff, but we can get that from our product management folks and try and, you know, uh, maybe maybe have some have some guest speakers on one call or another that are come in and talk to this. Uh, my sense is we're not going to um, resolve this today. No. We're just. Apparently, really quick, we just started a discussion, and yep. for my board, I, I don't think you've got answers to your questions. Do you, Mike, Chuck? I think the conversation is headed in the right direction. You know, from that perspective, I, <laughs> it's a very, very deep topic, so there's lots to to cover. But I, I would be interested in, in somebody that has done it and, you know, can talk about their experience. You know, yeah. if I can track that down, you know, at the Midwest user group, we'll be hearing from Kemper insurance. They've done this. Uh, we know. Cool. Uh, BYU <clears throat> Brigham Young University has been through this, so. Uh, there are some experts that I, I can reach out to and we'll see if we can pull that together. There's one question from Chuck, and if you leave this diagram up, <clears throat> Mike, how do we replicate a traditional dev QA, you know, SDG production style uh, environment? Uh, <clears throat> and I guess part two are the all in one open shift clusters, separate clusters. Those are two questions. And if you answer those, then we can begin to say hey, we actually did get an answer. <laughs> well, the first answer is pretty simple. I mean, you know, this, again, in terms of what I'm talking about here, meaning, you know, cloud is a non sas thing where I'm just going to lift and shift my environments from one side to the other. Um, and again, I'm not, I'll talk in a minute about some of the cloud hosted services that can make life easier you know, as part of this, but let's just assume for a minute that I'm going to do exactly the same thing on the right side of this thing as I do on the left side. Um, again, not trying to trivialize this, this is a data center migration, right? It's no different than migrating from, you know, two private data centers, you know, from one private data center to another private data center than it is from one private data center to a cloud hosted data center. It's still a migration, but you're basically going to create your same dev test and production environments on the right side of this thing, right? You can deploy and have the same configuration on the right side that you have on prem with the left side. Now, you don't have to do that. And again, for some clients, 
you know, their way of dipping their toe in this is putting their dev and test environments over on the right-hand side, and they leave their production environment on their private network currently, right? And it's just a way of, again, you know, if they have relatively high, you know, cost allocations that are getting allocated to them for use, because a lot of private sector clients especially, you know, they get charged back for the data center capacity that they leverage. And some of those things are relatively expensive, right? And so they've found it, you know, the business units have found it more cost effective to move some of their stuff off their private sector, private data centers to the cloud hosted data centers because it's cheaper. Um, and that's just sort of part of their cost model. And so, you know, you could move a test and a dev and test environment over to the hosted side and leave your production stuff on the left hand side. But logically, you know, you don't really need to view them separately. Now, I'm sorry, what was the OpenShift-related question that you mentioned, David? Well, I, Mike, it's Chuck. I can explain it a little bit. So I guess where I, what I was really trying to get at is, do you, in order to support that, let's say we, we, we want to move our dev QA and stage environments, right? In order to support that, is it one OpenShift cluster that runs all three of those, or is it three OpenShift clusters? Well, so it can, you might not know it, the answer, but that, that's where I was trying to go with it. So It can be either, right? So you can run three separate clusters if you want to. Um, you can run three different namespaces within a single cluster if you want to. Oh, so okay. you have the ability to do either way if you'd like. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another point I wanted to top on, you know, I've basically been talking about this, again, trying to keep the conversation a little simple to start with, as if, you know, look, I'm just going to lift, lift and shift everything on the left-hand side to the right-hand side. Um, the reality of it is, look, some things are a little bit more expensive and complex to manage operationally than other things. Um, and I'll pick one example, the database, right? So on-prem, managing a true HADR database with, you know, replicated uh, storage underneath, um, encrypted storage, um, you know, synchronous replication and or asynchronous replication across DR sites, being able to do that failover, being able to handle all of that kind of stuff can get relatively complicated and is a relatively tedious task. Cloud-hosted services, you know, have operationalized some of that stuff for you, right? So on AWS, for example, I can go off and provision RDS databases, either Oracle or Postgres or other things, um, and those are effectively, you know, largely managed databases. I can basically tell it how many, you know, availability zones I want it replicated across. I can have a DR um, um, cluster available in another region, and they will asynchronously replicate that storage for me. You know, all of that can be managed for me relatively simple, and I just have to pay the cost for that. Again, you know, this is the whole, you know, cost analysis piece that comes into play, but if, uh, if I'm willing to, you know, I can largely get out of the business of, you know, database management and leverage that service. And so it's still sort of a lift and shift from a logical standpoint, but rather than lifting and shifting and manage my database over on the right-hand side, I'm going to spin up an RDS um, um, set of instances that do a lot of that for me, and I'm going to point my compute nodes at that RDS instance rather than at some container or manually provisioned, managed, you know, uh, Postgres or Oracle instance that I'm managing. And that's true across a variety of things. Okay, so we're coming up on five on the hour. Again, everybody's time is critical. Um, I don't think we're going to come to a conclusion today. I'd like to hear from voices. Do you want to have an encore follow up? And if you do, can you write up really quick what questions you want to address in a, in a follow up encore? And Dave, you're really good at picking things apart. What are you hearing from us? Well, it also sounds like there's a whole subject of SAS as another another topic. We might have two two topics to invite Mike back to if he'll uh, if he'll put up with us. Yeah, you can ask for a raise now, Mike. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, I think the SaaS topic is important because we've got some, you know, developments around that as well. I mean, this is the other example is, you know, we have, oh, I don't know what the current number is, but it's somewhere in the hundreds of clients that are 
currently on our IBM cloud service. So these are clients that have chosen to move to cloud with a SaaS model and are using our service in a hosted way. Um, and, you know, that's indicative of two things. One is, you know, they think that there's a cost benefit even from a SaaS model, which tends to be sometimes a bit more expensive than running things yourself um, by moving it to cloud. And, um, you know, so they're moving to cloud by, you know, using a SaaS model to do that. Um, and again, sometimes it's a combination of those things because none of this has to be black and white. There's a lot of gray here and you can kind of choose you know, how much of this you want to move and how you want to move it. And again, like I said, with the sort of database thing, right, you can either continue managing your own database or you can leverage RDS as an example, which is effectively a database as a service kind of offering, or oftentimes what we call platform as a service kind of offering, a managed service to do those things. And so you can see that there's this sort of spectrum of, you know, how much of that stuff I want to manage and how much control I'm willing to give up and what the cost structure is associated with that. Okay, quick, Mike, Mike Hill, um, are you public or private? Sorry, what was the question? Yeah, we're, we're a private, you? private company. You're a private company, but you do lease your storage. That's correct. Okay. Um, Mike Custard, that was a question for you guys, whether or not you had to procure or you could lease your storage. I, I'm missing something, George. I don't understand the question. No, there, either you or Chuck, I was having a conversation and somebody, one of your units was looking to refresh storage and they were going to procure and the conversation was, well, maybe they can lease it instead. Mm. That hasn't been a conversation on my side. With one of you Minnesota guys, I had the conversation. I just don't remember who. Okay. So we're running out of time. Uh, in the chat, you got Dave's email. I just put up my email. If you have questions, follow ups that you want, please share them so we can structure it. Um, there, there's a lot to unpack here, including the fact that IBM just announced a an agreement with Amazon to host uh, software as a service. I don't, we don't know what that means, but it sounds interesting, and that's what Dave was alluding to. So it sounds like we have an ongoing discussion. I need some feedback because. Technically, we're supposed to start again the first Thursday of the month. So that means August. I need to know what topic you want to follow up on. Anybody want to chime in real quick before we run out? Shouldn't we do one of the follow ups that we we're outlined so far? Either have a, you know, an actual business user or okay. talk about SaaS or okay. just continue this conversation. That's. That, that's my two cents worth. Give, give me give me three bullets and send them to the board distribution list. And we'll have okay. other people sign in. I've captured all the chat too. There were a lot of different questions coming in, so we'll we'll begin to organize them perhaps into to a flow. You know, we got into why would we do it, and then we got into some how tos, and then it started to get much deeper than that. So that's a good start. It's a good part one. No, I mean. You know, as a practitioner, this is what you do. You you build up a big mm -hmm. pile of stuff and you sort it out and you try and make sense of it. Yep. But finding examples, not just um, anecdotal, but hardcore examples, be it public or private, where they've created a hybrid environment, how effective is it, and how did they quantify their savings? It's okay to say that you're going to save money, but eventually you got to prove it. In our case, the budget, because budget is mean. They're just mean people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, you guys mentioned, you know, the announcement around, you know, our, our partnership with Amazon and, you know, the hosted services we're going to do there. So one other thing we could do is I can take you through some of the details about how we're hosting 
in AWS and what that looks like and why we've made some of the technical decisions we've made in doing that. It doesn't really cover the sort of migration aspect of it, but it does cover, you know, the topic of, you know, which services, which platform services we're leveraging and what some of the things are we're anticipating taking advantage of within their native services once we get there, et cetera. Okay. And I just want to share with everybody, just because we didn't come to a logical conclusion after our first uh, discussion, that's not a bad thing. It just, it shows what the complexity is and what we need to do to figure out how to move forward. And we're all being asked about this and there's nothing really, no real hard data to make decisions on. Not a I'll simple topic, I can dig a lot of complexity here. I'll see what I can dig up in, like I say, your public references we can look at or folks who might want to uh, tell us their story. And um, yes, we've recorded today and I've got, you know, there were a couple of slides. We'll make sure that they're available in the IBM business automation community. And I can send an email to all attendees when it's up there, probably sometime tomorrow. Mike Winter. Boy, I don't know if you knew what you were getting into, but this is uh, pretty exciting, pretty fun to be part of it. Thank you so much for being our first special guest uh, for the practitioners. George, I bet you got a final word you want to say. Well, just thank you, everybody. This is uh, this is the proverbial onion, and right now we're crying. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Likewise, thank you guys. That was a great conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. We'll we'll be in touch, and we'll figure out the date for the next uh, for the return engagement.